and thank you once again for attending uh, Great Lakes Water Protection Class. Uh, I invite speakers from all around the, uh, <clears throat> the area to come speak in this class, and the students really appreciate it, so thank you very much. All right, so it's a real pleasure to be here to address you all today, especially being on traditional Haudenosaunee territory and, and traditional territory of Anishinaabe as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a pleasure. All right, my purpose here today in this little brief moment um, <clears throat> is to give you a bit of an aperitif, um, talking about the current status of the connecting channels in the, throughout the Great Lakes. And the purpose is to um, tell you a bit about them if you don't know a lot about them. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, also to let you know that we don't know enough about them, but there's hope. All right, so if you can focus in on this map from the 17th century, uh, you'll see exactly where we're located. Uh, the reason I draw attention to it is the fact that this map dates from hundreds of years ago, uh, but you'll notice that the Lakes look kind of amorphous. Well, they, you can make out generally where they are. Um, but what's of interest is look at the density of all the rivers that are on those maps and the connecting channels amongst them. Or sorry, amongst the, amongst the lakes. So those are actually done quite accurately. And that's because of the significance of these uh, bodies of water that are found throughout this region. So these are the uh, <clears throat> more uh, modern map here. The connecting channels, uh, as a biologist, I always was struck by this term connecting channels. When I first read the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, <clears throat> I thought, oh, that's, 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 that's such a crude name to call them. Um, they're, they're rivers, you know, but actually they're more than just rivers. Uh, they are the uh, straits, for example, uh, and there are canals that are now considered to be connecting channels. Um, and they actually, it's a very appropriate term, so it's kind of an, an encompassing term. So I'll just draw your attention to them uh, from the top. We've got the, the St. Mary's River, St. Mary's, uh, draining Lake Superior into Lake Huron, Michigan. The Straits of Mackinac, now those aren't normally considered to be a connecting channel, but by definition, I call them a connecting channel. Because that's one lake, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's a, a spot where there's a corridor between the two water bodies. Fish are gonna be traveling through it. Water flows from one to the other. But interestingly, <clears throat> sometimes you get water flowing from Michigan to Huron and occasionally the reverse. So it's a really kind of an interesting situation. And also there's an aging pipeline underneath it so of interest. The, the one thing that's not natural is down by Chicago, you've got the, the ship canal. <clears throat> and that ship canal is unnatural that was created to actually drain water out of Lake Michigan into the, uh, uh, the, the Mississippi River shed. And people have used it for, um, for, for, for making better water quality on the near shore of the Chicago River, but it's also had some impact on things like invasive species coming into the lakes. Uh, then we have uh, what's called the Huron-Erie Corridor. From Lake Huron, you go down through the St. Clair River, Lake St. Clair, the beautiful uh, delta there, <clears throat> into the Detroit River, and then you're down into to Lake Erie. So that's essentially one long corridor. Niagara River we're familiar with, and most familiar with, we hope, the, the St. Lawrence. <clears throat> Okay, so what are these, um, these bodies of water? They are corridors for uh, transportation. We, we heard about the Green Marine and the importance of, uh, or the initiative there, and that's, uh, they've been used for transportation for, 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 for eons, actually. Uh, <clears throat> they're meeting places. There's major cities on, the, uh, on these uh, corridors. They're defensible. You know, from Quebec City, obviously, that's, a, that's far down the, the system, but, but also throughout the Great Lakes, there have been places where you've had uh, forts established for trading, but also for, for defending. So they have a lot of important social um, importance. They play a role in nation development. You'll notice that the borders throughout the Great Lakes follow the connecting channels, and that's for, for a reason. Uh, flowing water, um, hydropower is a big one. Okay, we've got a couple places now where they make tremendous amounts of power to our uh, our social benefit, um, you could argue, uh, but also that f with that power came uh, the production of uh, or, or establishment of, of industry, and with that concomitantly you came came areas of concern. So each of the connecting channels, with the exception of uh, Mackinac, have areas of concern associated with them. 
Finally, there are uh, really important uh, transition zones, and you'll hear more about the fish and birds later on. So fish spawn there, they migrate there, they, they, they accumulate, they live mostly in the lakes, they come to these Kerkin channels to, to breed. And because they're corridors and meeting places, that's where you have meetings of people and, and these biota. And so they're really important places for uh, interactions. And so essentially they're, they're intersections in our society. So social, economic, and ecological intersections. So think of those corridors as being that. <clears throat> All of them are, are physically impacted now. Uh, this schematic diagram that I drafted up yesterday um, is a, an attempt to sort of explain it in the kind of a schematic way. So you've got uh, water flowing downhill. Okay? You've got potential, the water up high versus low, the physical fact. Uh, a lot of times this water is dammed at the bottom. So in the Niagara um, and the St. Lawrence and St. Maris, actually, there's three places where they produce power. Um, you've also got diversions. The, the Chicago is obviously one diversion out of a lake, but often you have diversions to make power, to feed water for canals. And the canals now circumvent, in many cases, these, um, um, these, these channels, and so they're, they're artificial, so artificial water routes. And so with the Welland Canal, we ended up with lamprey in the, in the upper Great Lakes. And so that was a, uh, definitely a, a physical impact that caused biological and social impact. So we don't know much about these systems. This quote by Dodge is quite succinct. <clears throat> this uh, graph, the only graph you'll see today in my talk, is, uh, just shows the number of publications across the Great Lakes, including the connecting channels. And what are lowest in all of those are the information, this is the number of publications from two different sources, that were uh, that focused on those specific geographic areas. And so you'll see that those rivers and straits are the least studied amongst them. Despite the importance of the St. Lawrence River, the number of publications is equal to, well, the lowest of all the other areas in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> in the Great Lakes. And that, that, that's a bone to pick for me. So speaking of the St. Lawrence River, what do we know about it? Very little, unfortunately. Um, and when it comes to adaptive management, it's really hard to manage something you don't know fully about. Um, I draw attention to an article, uh, not an article, these are, these, are, these are comprehensive studies, three of them. Um, one from 1931. This is the only comprehensive biological study we know of the St. Lawrence River prior to the dam being built. Okay, 1958, 50s, there were no environmental impact assessments. They just up and did it. And they, yes, this is for progress. So that's the only thing we can refer to other than traditional knowledge which uh, uh, is out there. Uh, we also have, let's see, Great Lakes Water Quality Board, 1983. There's a, uh, a compendium, included uh, information from the, 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 the winter navigation study. And then we have Patch and Birch in 84. And since then, we really don't have much. We have individual papers, but never the really large comprehensive studies that you really need to show that we have control over, or we know of, what's in our ecosystem. So the good thing is um, the recent Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement, the 2012 protocol, states this in Annex 2C. It states that each of the lakes will have a lake-wide management plan, and each of those plans will include a connecting channel. So for Lake Ontario, before the lake management plan didn't talk about the Niagara River or the St. Lawrence River, it just talked about Lake Ontario. But now, it behooves the agencies to consider the Niagara River and the St. Lawrence River to the border. And so this is good. This is a, this is a step forward. <clears throat> but there are impediments still. Um, the current impediments are uh, the infrastructure that's out there. Okay, do, you can take a large ship and you can study Lake Ontario and all the other lakes with these large naval, uh, with these large research vessels, but when you try getting it into, say, Chippewa Bay or something like that, you're going to have some constraints. Okay, so there's that infrastructure that's not available yet for studying connecting channels properly. There's a limited knowledge uh, base that I mentioned earlier. How do you how do you understand something? How do you plan for plan a, even a scientific study if you don't know that much about the system to begin with? Um, coordination among agencies uh, can be a constraint. Uh, 
nowadays there's a lot better coordination. In fact, next year, or this year, 2018, this Coordinated Science and Monitoring Initiative on Lake Ontario, Niagara River, and the St. Lawrence. So American and Canadian agencies are getting together to uh, intensely uh, study the, the, the region, which occurs every five years, if you didn't know. Highly qualified personnel. Okay, a lake is not a river. Uh, not many people study rivers. In the past, those agencies have been focused on studying and monitoring more of the lakes. And so there's actually a cultural restraint to that. So how do you now convince someone that, you know, you've got this, this document that says Plan 2014, Plan 20, uh, not 2014, sorry, the, the 2012 protocol states that you now must include the St. Lawrence River, but if no one in your agency is involved with doing that beforehand, it's going to be kind of difficult to start now change gears. Not only that, though, you're being asked to do more work, and you might not, be, you might not have uh, adequate uh, fiscal resources to do that. So those are always big challenges. Uh, good news is at the top um, that the International Joint Commission approved a, a, a a, what's called a working group to examine the, the, the programs amongst these connecting channels. And so what we're going to do is actually uh, <clears throat> assess across the Great Lakes Basin how well the parties, which is Canada and the United States, are doing with respect to honoring the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. I can tell you right now that the St. Lawrence River won't score very high unless they pull something out of their hat in 2018. Uh, but something like the Lake Erie Huron Corridor has done very well. In fact, there have been very good provincial, state, and, uh, and tribal uh, nation uh, involvement with, with understanding fish movements in that, in, that, uh, in that corridor in the past. So uh, that's a nice example that we can, as a community in this region, look to for something similar. Thank you.